Hey guys, Marcus Milani coming to you from the sunny Southwest, uh, the Equity King. I want to go over a few things real quick that I had a couple of questions about and people had called me. They said, what are some of the main areas where newbies stop, trip, fall, fail, you know, or whatever. And I just wanted to kind of go over this. I actually just wrote a, I wrote a post on this about two years ago on Bigger Pockets. It's biggerpockets.com. I'm a uh, blog subscriber and a blog writer on that site. And I just wanted to kind of reiterate it and go over it again because there's a lot of newbies getting started that's having some problems in certain areas. And I just want to kind of go over, you know, five of the main key problems where newbies trip and fall. So first, I want to just jump right in. If you need additional content, you can go to um, equityrealestateblog.com that's equityrealestateblog.com uh, to get additional information for newbies and then also again like I said I write for Bigger Pockets so you can go to biggerpockets.com um, and look my name up Marcus Maloney and you see all of the articles that I've written and some of the things that I've responded to so um, let's just jump right in this is going to be on my YouTube channel, so you can also go to Marcus Maloney, um, YouTube slash Marcus Maloney, and you'll find this video as well. So let's jump right in and, and go forward. So one of the main areas where newbies trip and fail, and I'm not talking about just the psychological, but I'm talking about you know the actionable steps where newbies trip and fail. And a lot of times when you're just getting started, granted, I understand. You don't have a lot of money, you know, you can't spend, you know, 5,000 a month, 10,000 a month in marketing, you know, or even 30,000 a month in marketing that some of these other guys um, and larger players do, but you can start somewhere. So uh, let's kind of go over some of the steps where you may have find yourself in trouble or find yourself failing. So one is marketing. So I'll just put some of these things up. Um, a lot of times, newbies trip and fall, fall with marketing because, again, like I said, they don't have the large budget. They don't have the money. You know, they, they're putting things on credit cards and everything like that to get started. I started the same way. You know, when I started my first direct mail campaign, you know, I had a small little Capital One and first Premier card and was running that thing up. I only had like a $1,200 balance, but I ran that thing up and it was all on direct mail and actually it worked out and it was very beneficial for me. So uh, one is marketing and first is direct mail. One of the problems newbies have with direct mail is that they start and then stop. You have to be consistent. You have to keep going. You have to have a budget set. You know, if you got, if you have $1,500 that you can spend on mail, don't use all of the $1,500 at once. You know, you might want to space that out over, you know, two or three months. If, you, if you're if doing something small and you can only send, you know, 100 letters a month or 100 letters a week, you start there, you know, and you just be consistent. Get the phone to ring a little bit at a time, you know, that way you can start getting comfortable with and talking to sellers. So, um, direct mail, start and stop. And another thing, you know, you don't have to be perfect. Your letter don't have to be outstanding. It don't have to be something amazing. You know, just get it in the mail and have a phone number on it and that will be suffice. You know, it doesn't have to be something glamorous. You know, just get it out there and get started. Um, another thing with marketing is AdWords. Uh, normally, if you don't have a big budget, you, you really don't want to start with AdWords because that can get that can run up and get pretty expensive pretty quick. So uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this uh, because I'm actually not a professional or well versed in this. Uh, but I do want to say that I have tried it. It can get a bit expensive, but it can draw leads automatically. You know, you can have that system going while you sleep, getting leads while you sleep. So AdWords is one. Um, to tie in with direct mail, you can use click to mail. 
you know, this is another area where newbies trip and fall is that, you know, this click to mail goes directly and association with your direct mail. So you can go right online. You don't even have to talk to anybody. You can pull which letter you want to use um, and then upload that and pay online and click to mail and start sending those letters out to those addresses that you have. But you have to have, you know, the addresses. I spoke about that before. You know, there are certain sites like listsource.com, Rebo Gateway, uh, Gateway.com, um, Equifax or Experian.com. You can go to those different sites and pull lists. Um, you can pull a list of, you know, like 200 names for about, I think like 50 bucks, something like that. So you can definitely get started. Um, next, bandit signs. A lot of newbies get started with bandit signs. And if you don't have a lot of money, I suggest you start here, either here or direct mail. But bandit signs is a good thing. But you have to put in the work. It's sweat equity. You have to get out there and put the signs up. Um, there's different places online. You can just Google bandit signs where you can get your bandit signs created, have a dedicated phone number for that bandit sign. That way, when people see it, they can give you a call. Um, you can actually find a lot of buyers from bandit signs. One of my main buyers uh, that buys the deals for me and actually is looking at a, at a, at a um, deal right now found through bandit signs. I had my bandit signs out and in, in Phoenix and he gave me a call and said, Hey, I'm looking for deals. And I just started pitching them everything that I had and he, he just started eating them up. So bandit signs, uh, the good thing is, um, it's low cost, but a lot of sweat equity. You need to put your bandit signs out, you know, on Friday, pick them up on Sunday, because the sign police will be out Monday through Friday getting these signs. So put them out Friday evening. Um, put them out Friday evening. Pick them up you know, Sunday evening. Uh, but if you do have the money, you can just put some out and leave them out and see what happens. See what, see what calls you get. I have some banded signs that have been put out. Eight months ago that I still drive and happen to see them up on telephone poles and things like that. Uh, don't put any bandit signs out anymore. I don't personally, um, but it's a good way to uh, get started. The next is very easily word of mouth. One of my best deals I got from word of mouth. Um, so you just have to tell people what you're doing, what you're trying to do, and the universe will start to help you and you'll start gaining some momentum, but you have to get out there and talk about what you're doing. Don't be ashamed. You know, if you haven't closed the deal, so what? Everybody had to get through their first deal. So let's start with word of mouth. Um, that's one of the things that you need to do is get out there, go network and go to re events go to wholesaling events go to investor events go to meetup.com you can find all of those events you know on meetup.com so these are a few for marketing so let's go in and let's look at you know number two that we can use to help you get started in some of the areas where newbies tripping trip and fall you know, and the reason why I can speak on this is because, believe me, my knees have been bruised, elbows have been bruised, ego's have been bruised, you know, a lot of things that I went through and things that I'm still going through and still learning, you know, is because I just took the steps and jumped out there and started doing it. So, uh, the second area, seller conversation. After you have that phone ringing, um, you know, it, it can be fearful. You know, one of the things is, oh boy, this is the holy grail for new investors. This is the hardest thing that a lot of them seem to uh, have problems with. But it's very, very easy. One of the things you have to do is 
For one, have confidence. Even if you haven't done a deal, even if you haven't closed a transaction, so what? Your seller does not know. You know, have the confidence. Talk to them. You're just having a conversation about a property, just like you do um, with another newbie that's getting started. You just have that conversation. You know, you can you can just ask questions about the about the property. Hi, Mr. Seller. You know, you received a letter or you gave me a call from a bandit sign about your property. You know, first of all, what's your address? I appreciate you giving me a call. What's the address? Uh, get the address. Okay. Now, why are you looking to sell? What particular reason, you know, had you to give me a call? So on and so forth. Then you just go through and find out, okay, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, you know, have you done any updates? What does the property look like? Walk me through the property. And then you set, set and schedule that appointment afterwards. Um, you can have pre-scripted questions. In the beginning, um, it's okay to have this, but after a while you start becoming familiar with the conversation and then you feel more comfortable and you won't need these pre-scripted questions. A lot of time when I'm having a conversation with the seller, I have my feet kicked up on my desk and I'm just having a conversation like I'm talking to a friend. Or I walk around, you know, the office or around the house and I'm just talking with them, having a conversation. So just um, get comfortable. You can have those pre-scripted pre questions in the, in the beginning. And then again, like I said, you're just doing some info gathering. The big thing about having a seller conversation is shut up. Believe me, shut up. Ask the questions, shut up, let them talk. Once you get a seller talking, they'll tell you everything that you need to know, you know, and then you can ask some open-ended questions once they start to slow down and that it trigger them to get them right back started. So ask your question and then shut up. Um, you want to build a rapport. I normally do this, um, once I get the address, I'm normally at my computer. I Google the address and I see what's in the general vicinity of the of the property. You know, is there a park? You know, is it by you know a community library, some kind of landmark? And then I ask them about that landmark. Oh, okay. Well, I'm familiar with the area. How far are you away from you know Greystone Library? And then that triggers them, that helps build that rapport. And they say, oh, you know what, I'm not too far from the library. Da, 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 da. Okay, well, so on and so forth. That's how you can get that conversation started. Um, so that's part of building rapport and knowing the area. Some simple, simple things. Yes, it sounds very simple because it is very simple. Sometimes psychologically, we make it a lot harder than what it really is. It's not that difficult. You know, the next area where newbies trip and fall is the negotiation. You know, once you're in the property, you have a motivated seller, you're talking to them. After you get the ARV, and I already did a video on, you know, coming up with the ARV and many, many um, blog posts on coming up with the ARV, so I'm not going to get into that per se too much, but if you want more information on that, you know, just, just leave a message below and I'll answer those questions for you. So negotiations, um, and I'm not gonna write this, but put on your Academy Award winning presentation. Talk to the seller, you know, um, act like you've been there before, act like you've done this before, you know. A lot of things that I like to do is when I'm negotiating, I like to mimic, you know, if the seller have their arms folded, you know, like this, I'm a fold my arms, and then I'm going to let them down, you know, psychologically, you know, with no linguistic programming, it breaks a lot of barriers, you start feeling a lot more comfortable, not only you, but the seller as well, so 
uh, with the negotiations, you know, talk to talk, walk to walk, you know, have that conversation with them, negotiate. Normally, the best thing to do is to no negotiate in the worst area of the house. You know, so if, if the house have water damage in the bathroom and let's say the ceiling is showing water damage, you know, you negotiate right there. Hey, you know what? The reason why, you know, we have to come up with this offer, you know, is because, you know, things like this, the water leaking. We don't know what's behind that wall until we open it up. It could be mold back there. It could be mildew, something like that. So you have to, um, and you have to drive these points home. Um, then also qualify the seller. You know, when you're talking to them, make sure they want to play ball. Make sure that they are really motivated to sell. You know, a lot of people will give you a call and this is what I get a lot of times is, hey, what's your offer? I don't know. Tell me a little bit about the property. You know, well, if you don't know what you want to offer, then we, we don't need to have this conversation. Well, naturally, that's not a motivated seller, you know, and sometimes you do have those sellers that call in like that, but after talking with them, some of them you can talk with them and start having that conversation and they let those guards down and they let you in so you can really um, start to find out about the property and find out what situation that they have that they need solved. Um, so make sure you qualify the seller. Make sure they want to play ball. You know, Make sure you, know, you guys are in the same area. You know, find out why he wants or she wants to sell. You know, what's the need? Is it do they need to sell or do they want to sell? That's a big difference. Need to sell situation, you know, immediately you're in with a motivated seller. Want to sell, that person may not be so motivated. All right. And then ask the seller if there are plenty of repairs, ask them what they think the cost of those repairs may be. You know, they'll say, well, I'm not a contractor. I really don't know. You know, then you say, well, just just the ballpark, you know, is it twenty thousand dollars for the repair, ten thousand, fifteen thousand? Just try and find out, you know, get a number from them to see what they think that the repairs may may be. And like I said, a lot of times they're gonna say, I'm not contractors, I don't know. But the point of that is for you to to trigger in their mind that this property needs some work and it's gonna take some money in order to get it fixed up. All right. Um, next, the inspection period. A lot of newbies get hung up on the inspection period. Hey, what is the inspection period for? Is it for me, you know, to inspect the property, to pay for a home inspector to come in? Absolutely not. The home inspection is for you. It's for you to get qualified buyers in the property. Um, and that way you have on a contract, hey, I have a 14-day inspection period. This is the reason why the seller has to, you know, open up the property, give you access to the property so you can have your contractors slash sellers to come through and view the property to make sure that you can get a buyer. Um, it's a little bit more difficult when the property is rented. Uh, if the property is rented and there's a tenant in place, I normally ask for a longer inspection period. And the reason why I do that is because, you know, with tenant right laws, you may not be able to get into the property right right away. So a lot of times you have to notify the tenant 48 hours before before you can come in the property. A lot of times tenants are pretty, pretty all right. I haven't ran into anyone or any tenants that's been real harsh on letting me in, but Again, that inspection period is for you to get your buyers in the property, view the property, and see if it's something that they would be willing to put in and offer on it. Um, so that's just a brief uh, thing about the inspection period. So again, it's not for you to have a home inspector to come and inspect the home. It's just an opportunity for you to make sure you know what you're buying, qualify your buyers. And then if the property doesn't work out, you can always say, yep, you know what? We don't want to go through with this deal. No harm, no foul. We don't want to go through the deal because, you know, my partner that's in on a transaction didn't like the property, so on and so forth. All right. And then finally, let's wrap up real quick. Again, selling the property. This is with the inspection period, you know, 
Um, especially when you're just getting started, it, it, it's a little bit harder to sell properties because you don't have the big buyer database or anything like that. So a lot of times you have to co-wholesale. What is co-wholesaling? Um, that is where you have, you work with a well-known wholesaler that's in your area and say, hey, I got this property. Um, can you send it to your buyer's list? You know, a lot of times you have to build up that relationship with that wholesaler in order to do it. But then, you you know, you can split the prof profits however you want to split it. It can be 50-50 split, 60-40 split, 65-35 um, split, however, you know, so you can call wholesale. Also, you could do Craigslist, Craigslist, um, Postlets, which is Zillow. to put the property out there. Um, believe me, my first few transactions, I did Craigslist and Postlets and sold the properties and cleared about $27,000 on my first two, first two deals. And believe me, I didn't know what the heck I was doing, really. Um, it just happened to work out. That's why I say you just have to get out there and start. Do away with the fear everybody makes mistakes you know as long as you follow the guidelines you will not be in any trouble or no um, legal recourse towards you but you just have to make sure you get out there and get started so again these are elementary steps these are elementary steps but they are for the newbies that's getting started if you have any questions please feel free to leave your comments below make sure you subscribe I'm here you know once a week well, I would say twice a month, once every other week, doing some quick lessons on how to get started as a real estate wholesaler. All right, it's Mark, equityrealestateblog.com, uh, signing off.